Hey, what's up everyone? It's Mike and welcome back. In this video, we're going to be talking about the history of central banking in the United States. It's the first of a small series on the Federal Reserve, so be sure to check out the others. The history of central banking in the U.S. began with the ratification of the Constitution in 1789. Alexander Hamilton was the Secretary of Treasury at the time, and he had an idea to create a federal banking system to solve the nation's debt problems after the Revolutionary War. His idea was to create a federal bank that could issue paper money, much in the same way the Bank of England had been doing up until then. Hamilton was a Federalist and believed in a strong central government. His opposition, Thomas Jefferson, who was the Secretary of State at the time, believed that a strong central government should exist merely to maintain foreign relations, and he generally favored states' rights, especially in regards to banking. He thought that a central bank would benefit the merchants and investors at the expense of the majority of the population. Hamilton ended up winning the debate by saying that the Constitution gave Congress the power to collect taxes, borrow money, and pay debts, all of which would be aided by a central bank. George Washington and Congress both agreed with Hamilton, and in 1791, Washington signed the bank bill, which granted a 20-year charter to the first bank of the United States. However, after those 20 years, the charter was not renewed and the bank closed in 1811. The War of 1812 once again left the U.S. burdened with high debt costs, rising inflation, and a devalued money supply, which made it tough for the government to borrow money and make its payments. In 1816, a new 20-year charter was given to the second bank of the United States. However, due to the distrust by the American people and the centralized power of the bank, the charter once again failed to renew and the bank closed in 1836. We were now entering the free banking era where state chartered banks popped up everywhere. Since there was no federal regulation process of these new banks, by 1860 there were upwards of 8,000 different state banks and every one of them had their own paper currency. You can imagine how much of a nightmare this was. Since banks didn't have strict reserve requirements, when people became fearful that their bank might be going under, they quickly withdrew all their money, forcing banks that didn't have enough deposits on hand to close. As word eventually spread of the banks that were starting to fail, everyone started withdrawing their money. Adding fuel to the fire, at the same time as all these banks were falling, the stock market was also triggering fear throughout the economy. In October of 1907, the stock market had declined 50% from the year prior. The public's frustration with the banking system continued to grow until the bubble eventually popped in what is known as the Panic of 1907. A scheme to manipulate the stock price of United Copper led to the fall of Knickerbocker Trust Company, which is one of the largest banks in the U.S. As word got out about the scheme, everyone ran to take their money out of the banks, fearing that there wouldn't be anything left. J.P. Morgan, who was one of the wealthiest financiers, stepped in by gathering some of his wealthy friends to provide liquidity to the struggling banks, and acted as a one-man central bank with the authority to decide which banks failed and which received funds. He single-handedly engineered the bailout of New York City banks. In response to the bailouts, Congress formed the National Monetary Commission led by Senator Nelson Aldridge. He was tasked with studying the current banking laws in both the U.S. as well as Europe to determine what would become the foundation for the banking system that we have today. In the fall of 1910, Aldridge was convinced that the U.S. needed a central bank. He also realized he needed the banker's help to draw up the blueprints for a central bank, so he came up with a plan to gather some of the most important bankers in secrecy. The meeting was to be held at what Muncie's magazines described as the richest, the most exclusive, the most inaccessible club in the world known as Jekyll Island. The group included Henry Davison, who was a senior partner at J.P. Morgan, Abram Piat Andrew, an economics professor at Harvard University, who was also the Assistant Treasury Secretary, Charles D. Norton, the President of the First National Bank of New York, Benjamin Strong, the VP of Bankers Trust Company, which was a large bank where J.P. Morgan had a majority voting control and who eventually went on to become the Governor of the Federal Reserve Bank of New York, Frank A. Vanderlip, President of the National City Bank of New York, which today is known as Citibank, and Paul Wahlberg, a partner at Kuhn Loeb & Company. To make sure that word didn't get out, Aldridge told the men to come one at a time to a train terminal in New Jersey to board his private train car. Once aboard, the men were instructed to use only first names so that the staff wouldn't figure out their identities. 
It's speculated that J.P. Morgan was the one who arranged access to the clubhouse at Jekyll Island for the group to discuss the ideas around creating a central bank. One of the attendees, Paul Warburg, later wrote about the reason for the secret meeting in his book, The Federal Reserve System, Its Origin and Growth. It is well to remember that the period during which these discussions took place was the time of the struggle of the financial titans, the period of big combinations of businesses with bitter fights for control. All over the country, there was a deep feeling of fear and suspicion with regards to Wall Street power and ambitions. By the end of the trip to Jekyll Island, Senator Aldridge and his colleagues had developed a plan for a single central bank with 15 branches across the country. Aldridge presented it to the National Monetary Commission in January of 1911, but did not reveal where he had come up with the ideas for his proposal. With a heated presidential election on the horizon, the Democrats campaigned against Aldridge's new plan, and Woodrow Wilson ended up winning the presidency. With the Democrats taking control of both the House and the Senate, they were able to put a stop to Aldridge's plans. However, the ideas for a central bank still lived on with the leaders of the Democratic Party. The chairs of the House and Senate Committees on Banking and Currency, Carter Glass and Robert Owen, drafted new central banking legislature that very much resembled Aldridge's plans, with a few minor tweaks here and there. The Federal Reserve Act was passed by Congress and President Wilson signed it into law in December of 1913. The Federal Reserve has continued to operate as our central bank since that secret meeting on Jekyll Island, despite many people calling for its reform. I hope you enjoyed learning about the history of the Federal Reserve. For many people, it's a pretty controversial topic with the way that the bankers had so much influence over the legislative process. So I'd love to hear from you. What are your thoughts about the events that led up to the most powerful institution in the modern world? And make sure you give this video a like and subscribe to the channel. Your support really does mean a ton. I'll see you guys next time.